Even the word sounds electric. Embiid's historic night. And Cat 62 in a loss. And how did his coach react It was afterwards? an absolute disgusting performance of defense and immature basketball. And the Milwaukee Bucks stunner firing Adrian Griffin. Have you ever seen a coach fired at 30 and 13? Who says Doc Rivers first? Who says bring back Poodle? The 12th highest scoring game in NBA history. And because of Philadelphia's basketball history, the way the W's went west, and the Syracuse Nationals moved to, to Philadelphia to become the 76ers. It's the franchise record. 70 is greater than Wilt's 68. So Embiid, the franchise record for the 76ers. Look at the perfection from him last night. It's like those headlines about him not meeting the 65-game MVP minimum. He was like, watch this, watch this. 70, David Dennis Jr. What was the most impressive part of Embiid's night? The thing that impressed me the most about his night is the ease that this, he made this all look and how he did this in the flow of the game. And I guess, first of all, shout out to Bob Ryan. He would love this. Embiid only attempted two threes on his way to 70 points. But beyond that, he had five assists. Of the other two players, Elgin Baylor, Wilt Chamberlain at 70 and 18, and Beebe's the only one with five assists to show that he was doing this in the floor of the game. And on a macro level, the way that he has been dominant this season, 35 PER, which is literally off the charts. And the last 16 games, he has the highest point average in the last 16 games in the last 40 years. This is a remarkable heater that he is on, capped off by that game. Are there any points left to be made after Dennis scores 18 on 70? Emily Kaplan, I turn to you on Embiid's night. Most impressive part. The, we need to stop calling him the process. This is a man that is fully developed and fully arrived. You know, in a typical game, like, you have to get some shout-out here to Wemby and the Spurs because they hung in it. If it was a blowout, oh, so he would have been on the bench. But this was legitimate, right? Like, he scored all of them through the fourth quarter. He was just doing it with such incredible ease. I know we're all going to be talking about this MVP debate if he doesn't rage 65. Two things there. One, okay, 65 feels like an arbitrary number, but the history of NBA MVPs, there's only been one man to win it in a non-short season that played less than 65 games. That's Bill Walton. And two, okay, so he doesn't get the MVP. We're all going to remember this for the rest of his life. No longer is Wilt Chamberlain the only answer to every question, every <laughs> trivia question there ever was. And if he ramps up properly, he's going to win a championship, which is all he really wants this year. Mm-hmm. Look at the scoring on this show. On Ooh. the scoring from Embiid, I need a most impressive thing from Tim Kalishaw, Embiid 70. Well, if there's anybody who needs points, you come to the right place. Let me say this. He scored 70 points, and he only played 39 minutes. That's what impressed me the most. And this is not a knock on Wilt, who Emily just brought up. The year he set the scoring record, he averaged 48.5 minutes per game. That's a fact. <laughs> he, played all, he played every night. He played overtime. He didn't come out. That's, 39 wow. minutes, 70 points. My second favorite thing is after the game, instead of going off to a hero's welcome, did you see how long he stood on the court talking to Britt Brown, his former coach, who, who coached them through the very lean times in, in, in Pablo's favorite process, and, and he just stood there talking to him and listening to him, and he's such a genuine person uh, that, he, that he doesn't get caught up in the fact that he just scored 70 points. Yeah, I thought that was great, too. Wow, I can't believe the scoring on this show right now. Bill Plaschke, is there anything left? The most impressive part of Embiid's night last night. There is so much left. First off, this is the 18th anniversary of Kobe Bryant's 81 points. <laughs> I thought you might bring Don't that up. The but, okay, yes. Exact anniversary. Oh. No. And this was, in, a, in some ways, more complete game than Kobe. He, he, he's, he's the first player to have this many points with one or fewer turnovers since turnovers were invented. He's the first player in history to go 70, 15, and 5. He's the first player. He's, uh, David mentioned he played 39 minutes. That's the lowest number of minutes for any player who scored as many points as he's poured. Mm. And in some ways, this was the greatest game, scoring game in NBA history. This guy's a complete player. It was a complete victory. And again, I love Kobe and I miss Kobe, but this was in some ways more complete game than Kobe. Uh, maybe you guys are rounding up, but I have 37 minutes of my box score for MB last okay. night. David, can I ask you one question? Because we had you on in a show about a week and a half ago, I remember. We talked about the minimum 65 games and the rule for the MVP that came over last summer. We all heard it. We thought nothing of it. But now you're thinking of it a lot. Please, go ahead. 
Yeah, they, we can talk about the fact that there are not a lot of players who um, played fewer than 65 games to win the MVP, but we can also talk about the fact that we have not seen this sort of ca canal, this sort of, you know, distance between the first and person who should win MVP and second place between what is M Embiid is doing in a very long time, not since maybe Curry's unanimous or LeBron with the Heat. The game should not matter. If Jokic plays 68 games and Embiid plays 63, that should not be the determining factor who wins MVP. Did Kalisher, you want to address that? If you look last year, all the great players played 65, 68, 70 games. What is the league going to do if Embiid plays 64 games and all his competitors played no, 67, right. 68? You got to vote for them. They went over the 65 and threshold. Fashion. 65 games is not too much to ask. That's oh, missing the other 17 okay. games. Uh -huh. That's missing 17 games. Yeah. Goodness, anybody should be able to play the NBA and miss less than 17 games. Okay. And NBA will get that. Uh, they put them in the game to, to, to get the scoring record last night. They'll, they'll, they'll be a scoring the record for the first topic of the show. Congratulations, everybody. One thing I want, I needs to be said, Tim, you can repeat the stat, that Wilt Chamberlain averaged over 48 minutes a game for an NBA season because he played every game, played every minute, and then played overtime. Yeah. He missed, I believe, seven minutes of regulation time, but he played in 13 overtime periods, so he averaged so that, more. So I submit to everybody games. watching, is the most unbreakable record in sports. Right there. You have to. <laughs> Incredible. We'll move on. 48 In the same night of Embiid's 70, we had Carl Anthony Towns 62. Incredible. But 62 and the Timberwolves lost. Cat had 44 in the first half. The bench was loving it. They were feeding him. This was an Avadanza night. And then the wheels fell off. Hornets came back in the fourth. And in that quarter, Cat was 2 of 10. He wanted a foul on, on a big shot. Didn't get it. Missed the final three. After the game, you have to listen to Coach Chris Finch. It was an absolute disgusting performance of defense and immature basketball. We totally disrespected the game ourselves, um, and we got exactly what we deserved. Wow. Tim Kalisha, how does that criticism land? I, I love Chris Finch, and I always love his honesty. You know, he also went on to say that we rode Carl Anthony Towns for a while, but he kind of dried up at the end. He did shoot 60% for the night, and he made 10 threes. So he did have kind of a shooting night, but you're right. He, he missed a lot of shots in that drive was ill-advised at the end. I think he's feeling the heat from the fact they just lost Oklahoma City. Now they lost a home game you've got to win, and, and they're a half game ahead of the Thunder and Denver. They could be a third-place team in a couple days. Bill Plaschke, how would you hear a coach calling out a team for immature basketball, the biggest disrespect ever, in a game where one of his players has 62? I love it. I love it. He's being an educator as much as he is a coach. He's got a young team. And let's face it, Cat, you know what his plus minus was in a game he scored 62 points? Zero. His plus minus was zero. He contributed nothing defensively. He, he jacked up 10 shots in the fourth quarter alone. His team is second biggest blown lead in the NBA, in the NBA this season. They need to learn, and Cat needs to become a championship level player. He's not that yet. He's not, and I don't know if he'll, if he'll ever be that. David Dennis Jr., how'd you hear Chris Finch? First, I want to say something positive about, about Caddy. He did score 60 points, the second <laughs> center to score, have multiple 60-point games in his career. I think you can guess the other one. He also was the only player in NBA history with 10 twos, 10 threes, and 10 free throws. Mm. But the coach and everybody is absolutely oh. correct. This is a huge, huge problem with the Wolves that goes back a couple years. This is the team that did set the record for most blown double-digit leads in the first round. This is the team that season ended with Rudy Gobert punching people on the sidelines. This team has a maturity issue and that late in that game, it, when that game was still in question, they were feeding the ball to Cat and focused on his scoring record instead of winning. Anthony Edwards didn't really score until the end of that third quarter. This is the number one defense in the league, and they allowed the uh, Charlotte Hornets to, score, to shoot 57% from the field. That is just a lack of focus that they lost okay. in trying to beat. I will take one mute for, for David Dennis, Jerry. You said that they were feeding Cat there at the end of the game for his stats. Or maybe they were just feeding a hand that was the hottest hand they had ever seen this side of Embiid this season. Emily Kaplan, I go to you. 
Yeah, well, watching this and taking this game in, you realize that they really miss Mike Conley. They needed a veteran, an adult in the room to slow things down. It's like why you need a Kalashaw or a Plashkey on the show. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. just a veteran to, nice. to keep yeah. things in Thank line. You. Thank but you. I did listen to 22-year-old Anthony Edwards after the game, and it was the most refreshing and direct post game that I can even remember. And I'm going to support David Dennis, my other youngster here, because he said, like, yeah, we all lost the game. Like, once he had the score that we had at halftime, we were just feeding him because we wanted to get 80 or 100 okay. points. And that that's on us. And that is a maturity that they need to reach. And I think they're going to use this as a learning experience because they're a young team. They can get there. They're just not there yet. I'll give David those points back. Well done, Dennis. Ah, look at the scoring on this show. That's the points part of the program. Now the fire part of the program. This is a stunner. News of the day. Milwaukee Bucks firing head coach Adrian Griffin. The Bucks are 30 and 13. The two seed in the conference, they won last night. Though there were some images of Giannis drawing up play in the huddle. Not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing, just saying we saw that last night. Firing the first year coach Adrian Griffin today. What's your reaction to this, Tim Kalachuk? I mean, obviously surprised based on the record and the fact he just got there. But ever since the Terry Stott situation, an experienced coach leaving, there's been talk about Griffin's lack of communication. And I would, see, I would imagine Giannis and Lillard had trouble with that. This team hasn't played very good defense for, uh, for a team that has the defensive player of the year. And I think they feel like let's not wait to lose the playoffs. Let's get something done now. Bill Plaschke, uh, coach fired at 30 and 13. Does that raise an eyebrow for you? Tim, they were 30 and 13, Tim. 30 and 13. They don't play good defense. They won 30 games. They'd be leading the Western Conference right now. They, 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 did, they just got done beating Boston. He just got done beating Golden State. He went to a over overtime last second victory against Sacramento. This is a team with energy. This is a team that was one of the best in the league. 30 and 13. How can you do this? David Dennis Jr. Ow, firing why? the coach. First year coach before the All Star break. How'd it hit you? A, a lot of confusion. I don't know if you heard, Tony. They're 30 and 13. Not only that, Adrian Griffin has the fourth highest winning percentage in NBA history right now at this current moment, and he's okay. just been yeah. fired. And we could talk about the defense and how bad the defense was. That seems like a personnel issue, replacing Drew Holiday with Dame Lillard, and also the fact that their starters have the second best defense in the league. So this has to be an issue with the players not getting along with them and not what we're seeing on the and court. Emily Kaplan. 30 and 13, do I get my points there? Uh, yeah, no, sure, as Michelle said, no. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody as, makes fun of me. As long ahead. as there's no off-court transgressions that come out, um, this is absolutely shocking. And if we needed any more proof that the NBA is a star-driven league, like, this should put an end to it. There's been multiple instances this year where it does appear that Giannis has been frustrated on the sideline. So you, 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 that's where you go immediately, it. right? Yeah. It's the only thing that makes sense here. And look, maybe they just thought this was too good of a season with him, too much offense to the team, you got to cut your losses now. No one mentioned it. Coach, We've seen Rivers. this before. A coach fired at 30 and 11. Anybody? David Blatt. Oh, David Blatt. there it is. David and Blatt. what happened? He has won the whole thing David, that year David, with Teron Lou. Good job, Blatt. Coming David up, 30 and 13. we got one of my favorite topics. We're going to be talking about the Bucks' end of game strategy. They use analytics to go for two. Down eight. Analytics. But then they use their gut when they didn't call timeout. Gut! <laughs> How the Bucks play the end of game. Fire cell next. Something I think might blow your mind. Every football team except for the San Francisco 49ers has changed offensive coordinators over the last 24 months. That's fired or left, had to replace. It's over the last 24 months. The Eagles are in a position where they are replacing both coordinators for the second offseason in a row. Coordinators Brian Johnson on the offense and Sean Desai and the defense are out. Nick Sirianni remains. That's the move for Philadelphia. Bill Plaschke by herself. I can't believe Nick Sirianni still has a job. You gut the heart of the team and you keep the guy in charge of that heart. They had the second worst collapse in NFL history. You, you, you can't keep, if you get rid of the coordinators, you got to get rid of the head coach. It doesn't make any sense. Tim Kalashaw? I've never understood firing both and keeping the head coach. You didn't like the offense, you didn't like the defense, but you get to stay, and you got to do a better job this time. It just puts him on the hot seat for next year. Emily Kaplan? Yeah, I don't think Nick Sirianni should have kept his job, but here comes the next natural stage, which is scapegoating. Brian Johnson's firing really irks me, though, because it feels like he was handcuffed by Nick Sirianni's scheme, so he just really didn't stand a chance. 
David Dennis Jr. Yeah, this is a, another confounding decision involving a coach that we're, we're hearing today. There were so many good candidates out there. Either the Eagles did not reach out to the Harbaugh's and the Belichick's, or they weren't interested. In, in, in either case, that is a huge problem for the organization. I'm not sure why right. the stick was We straight. haven't heard reporting that they thought about Belichick, thought about Carroll, thought about Harbaugh. Although this is a case where they're keeping a coach. You know, the last topic was 30 and 13. This coach made the Super Bowl 12 months ago. 14 wins one year, 11 wins another year. They're keeping him, and now you guys are like, I can't believe it. You guys are on the other one side. One and five, Tony. One and I five. I understand. I understand. What we'll move on. Buy or sell, too. Still makes sense with the Buccaneers and the game strategy. So they were down 14. They scored the touchdown. They went for two. That had some decrying analytics. Let me tell you what I told my friend Mike Wilbon years ago, clearly to no avail. Just replace the word analytics with the word information and go from there. So put that to the side for a second because the end of game, not calling a timeout, that is the opposite of analytics. Look at the clock. This, this is trusting his gut and thinking the game was over. Here's Bowles' explanation after. It's not a gentleman's agreement. They were in field goal range. Uh, we'd have had 12 seconds calculated after using that timeout to come back from it. Then we would have been down 11 points. It's kind of pointless. You kind of know when the game is over, and the game was over. Tim, does Bowles' explanation make sense to you? Oh, my God. Todd Bowles needs to stop talking for his own safety. Nothing wrong with going for two. See Daryl Royal, Texas 15, Arkansas 14 in the big shootout for, for more info. Oh, but he okay. keeps talking about 12 seconds. Goff took a knee with 36 seconds. You got to watch what the Lions are doing. Right. You got to watch the final minute play out. It, they, field goals do get missed. They do get blocked. Dan Campbell might not have even tried the field goal. Might have punted. Play no, no, Dan out. Campbell was not punting. I, I can guarantee you that. Here's a few. <laughs> Dan Campbell was not. That's not how he plays it. But the way the Lions did play it, by snapping yes, at 14 seconds of the play clock. Yes, Emily Kaplan, I'll turn to you. Does Bowles' explanation make sense? You know, Todd Bowles is a really good coach with a timeout management problem. This has been a thing. There's some games where he doesn't even use them. If the information tells you that there's just a 0.1% <laughs> chance to win the game, you play until the final yes, whistle. What yes, message exactly. you send your team? It's the playoffs. David Dennis Jr. There's a problem with a lot of coaches that they have. They get in front of the microphone. They can't say something very simple. I made a mistake. Dan Campbell made a mistake by kneeling in the way that he did that left time on that clock. Bowles made a mistake by not looking at that scenario and calling a timeout, especially considering that just a few months ago, they had pretty much the same scenario against the Buffalo Bills where they almost won the game on a Hail Mary because he used his timeouts wisely. Mm. That game was not over, and he knows and it. And Bill Plash. Yeah, Todd Bowles needed to eat this one. Uh, he's so wrong. Patrick Mahomes won a playoff game with 13 seconds. In the final 13 seconds, he, they could have won that game. They quit. They say he said it was over. As Yogi Berra said, it's never over until it's over. He should have listened to the great, great one. He should have stayed. But it wrong. was so bizarre because it felt like nobody on the field, and you know, a game broadcast, you have to do certain things. They weren't focusing on it either on the game broadcast. And I'm looking around like, is nobody realizing what's happening here? They were snapping the ball. This doesn't work. happen. There could have been no time if Detroit had played the first or second down, first down and second down the right way. But once they started hiking the ball with 14 seconds left in the play clock, it's that one time out on the third down. They could have got the ball back with 30 seconds left, a missed kick. They could have had 60 yards to play with. Bill Flashkey, Tim Cowley. Look at the scores today. Emily Kaplan, David Dennis Jr. I know you're not happy to be in shutout, but you're going to love your yearly... Kyle Lowry goes to Charlotte in the deal. Look at Rozier's numbers this year. And as of right now, the Heat will have four 20-point scorers. Bill, to the scary Heat with Scary Terry, just reinsert themselves into East contendentship. This is a great trade. The last uh, Heat player to average 23-6 and six was LeBron James. But this is terrible for the Lakers. The Lakers should have made this trade. This was their okay. trade. All right. They could have All traded right. D'Angelo yes. Russell for yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that I'm means serious. you like it for the Heat, though. Okay. So you think this is a big for the Lakers. Yeah. Quick question. Who's averaging more points this year? Carl Anthony Towns, Zion Williamson, Jalen Brown, or Terry Rozier? You're right. It's Terry Rozier. This is a huge trade for the Miami Heat to get some young legs, to get that guard they need. They're right back in the hole. I'm not going to mute and Bill Flashkey for, for saying the Lakers, but Tim Kalashaw, you get the point. We'll move on. Edmonton Oilers, how many straight have they won? Anybody? 13. Ashkey got it first. Here's a point. The all-time oh. record, anybody? 
17. Bill Plasky. You are a trivia maven. They go for 14 in a row tonight versus the Blue Jacks. Blue Jackets had the longest streak seven years ago, 14 in recent times. Tim, what's most impressive about this? Uh, they're getting better goaltending, goal which is really all they've needed. It will be a shame if the Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl show never makes it to a Stanley Cup final. I think they're going to make it this year. We need to DP? see it. Stuart Skinner is the name of the goalie that you were trying to think of, Tim. He's been tremendous. <laughs> I want to ask you another point. Wins. Unbelievable. Coming back. The here. goals against has been cut in half. That's, it's all about goaltending. The Oilers are looking After great. the start they had to now emerge maybe as the favorite? Yeah. This is an incredible run for Edmonton. Colorado's still there. An incredible run for Plaschke to take the face time. Hmm. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tim. Chargers in the suspense. Do it now. Hire Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh in the suspense. Do it now. Coming to the Chargers. It's a match made in heaven. The Chargers need an offensive mind. They need a team builder. They need a big name in a big marketplace. He's perfect for that. Jim Harbaugh needs a place to go to the NFL so he can win a Super Bowl. With Justin Herbert, he can win a Super Bowl in, in, in Los Angeles. The Chargers have a lot of money. They can open the pocketbooks. Pay him what he deserves. Hire him now. Mm. Jim Harbaugh, come to the Chargers now. And the suspense? I don't know. The suspense is killing me. I hope it'll last. Happy 420, Plasky. For the visitors.